Hello everyone. Um, today we're going to go through um, trespass uh, to the person. Um, um, essentially, I'm going to take you through the definition of trespass to the person, the different thoughts that constitute uh, trespass to the person, the elements of each of those thoughts, as well as um, the defenses available in regard to each of um, those thoughts. Trespass to the person is defined as a direct or an intentional interference with the person's liberty or body. And there are basically three main thoughts under trespass to the person. And these are assault, battery, and false imprisonment. These three thoughts have two common elements. The first element is that these three thoughts are all actionable without the need to prove that damage has occurred. In other words, they are actionable per se. The issue of damage may only be useful in influencing the court in terms of the quantity of the word it may provide to the victim. Since these three thoughts are used to protect the civil rights or the person's dignity, even if it's, it's not critical to prove that injury has been occasioned against the victim. The important thing is that their right has been violated or the dignity of their person has been violated. The second common element to the three thoughts is that the wrong must be committed directly and or intentionally. In other words, if the invasion of the person's liberty or body is indirect or it's from an omission, then a cause of action cannot be uh, sustained in trespass to the person. The wrongdoer may, however, be liable in some other form of action like negligency or nuisance. And to this end, I invite you to look at uh, the case of Scott versus Shepard, where it was held that one of the requirements for trespass to the person is that the act has to be direct and physical. And where the interference is indirect, there may be a remedy through the total of nuisance or negligence, but not um, in trespass. This case fortifies what I have just stated um, above. I also um, invite you to look at the case of Stanley versus uh, Powell, where it was held that trespass to the person was not actionable in the absence of intention or negligence. This decision confirmed that trespass is a fault best thought. I also invite you to look at the case of Leitang versus Cooper and please read these cases. Um, in that case, Lord Denning was of the opinion that where the act causing the damage was intentional, the correct cause of action was trespass. Where the act was negligent, Neg where, where the act was negligent, the cause of action was in negligence. And uh, the, the learned judge also guided that there was no overlap between trespass and negligence. That nicely takes us to consider uh, the first thought under trespass to the person, um, which is assault. And assault um, 
is defined um, in Collins versus Wilcock. It's defined as any act of the defendant that directly and intentionally or negligently causes the claimant reasonably to apprehend the imminent infliction of a battery. Note that actual contact is not necessary in assault. It is enough for the victim to apprehend contact. The key elements or ingredients of assault are the defendant's act must be direct and intentional as already indicated in the case of Letang versus Cooper, which I, I already alluded to. Um, and it was stated in that case that where the act causing the damage was intentional, the correct cause of action was trespass. Intention here means that the action must be willful. It must be, it must be willful, it must be intended. The second element is uh, reasonable apprehension, and this is usually um, determined through a question of fact. At times, uh, we look at the test of a reasonable man to be able to determine uh, the, the, the whole issue of reasonable apprehension. This is because we are all different, and what may cause fear to one may not cause fear to the other. So you look at the circumstances and probably apply uh, the test of a reasonable man. Reasonable apprehension means, simply means instilling fear as a result of someone's gesture. Did I become apprehensive? Did I fear that harm is about to occur um, to me? For example, if a person points a gun at you, it's natural that it will cause reasonable apprehension. Whether that gun is loaded or not, um, it's, it's, it's difficult. It will not be um, easy for the wrongdoer to argue that uh, you were probably paranoid. Um, there was no need to fear because the gun was not even loaded. There, was, there is no means for you um, to, to, to establish to establish that, whether the gun is loaded or not. The natural thing is you fear if someone points a gun at you. It's immaterial whether it's loaded or not. However, in, um, in um, looking at acts um, that could cause reasonable apprehension, and uh, I also um, highlighted the test of a reasonable man, it is important to exclude incidents of people um, that are basically paranoid. If I'm engaged in a conversation, uh, say, with about four people, and in a bid to emphasize a point, I wave my, my arms in the air, and then the other person probably thinks I'm going to hit them because of that particular gesture, and they duck. And uh, this cannot be uh, perceived as a threat. The person that ducks is probably um, just being paranoid. And another example, um, if, if a person is already restrained, let's say they are, they are already locked up in a prison cell, and then they make some violent gestures towards one of the people outside, uh, clearly um, it, it's not possible that you could become apprehensive out of that. I mean, the person is already restrained, so is he going to pass through the wall or, or the prison bars and probably... Um, create harm to you. So um, if you, 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 you exhibit apprehension in such a situation, you could be probably, you could be deemed to be paranoid. 
so um, that test may may fail the test of reasonable apprehension may not succeed in that regard um, I invite you to look at the course, the case uh, of Thomas versus National Union of of Mine Workers. Um, it's a 1985 case. It could help you distinguish one situation which was considered not to be um, an an assault. The third, the third um, ingredient under assault is the existence of an imminent uh, battery, and I, I will still use, um, I will still use the example of the person restrained in a prison cell. If they make violent gestures towards you, um. Are there means that they are able to carry out that threat? The important thing, the critical thing to, to actually um, underlie in regard to imminent, imminent battery is that there must in all cases be the means to carry out that threat. So a person that's already restrained, properly restrained and they can never reach you, um, they would probably not have the means to carry out that threat. So probably you would fail uh, to prove the element that there was an imminent battery against you. This is different from, um, from a person that makes violent gestures towards you and moves towards you. And that, that person is restrained by other people, clearly. Before the person is restrained, they had the means to carry out uh, the threat. Um, previously, um, Mayor Wards um, could, not, um, could not constitute um, battery. The thinking was that there has to be some bodily movement. Some bodily movement was required for an assault um, to, to be, to be well-grounded. However, this position has since um, changed, and uh, um, you now I invite you to look at the case of R versus um, of R versus Island, where the House of Lords held that an assault can be committed by words alone. Hence, threats on a telephone, for example, may be an assault provided the claimant has reason to believe that they may be carried out in the sufficiently near future to qualify as immediate. And I also um, invite you to look at the case of Tuberville versus Savage, where it was stated that words that instill a reasonable fear for an imminent battery should equally amount to a tortious assault. So um, just to, to bring it all together, if one strikes another um, upon the hand, upon the hand or arm or breast in a conversation, it's not an assault since there is no intention to assault. But if one, for example, with the intention to assault, strikes at another and misses, this is an assault. Or if he holds up his hand uh, in a manner that is threatening, but says nothing, it is still an assault. So the important thing to the important thing to note here is that the intention as well as the act makes the assault. So let me go through now the, 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 second, uh, the second thought, which is battery. Um, battery is, is the direct and intentional application of force to another. 
person without that person's consent. The application of force must be voluntary and intentional. And to this end, a battery is distinguished from an assault by the fact that physical contact is necessary to accomplish a battery. It does not matter whether the force is applied directly to the human body itself or to anything coming in contact with it. Um, I'll give you an example here. If a, bat a person throws uh, throws a bottle containing water at someone and misses, that is an assault. But if some drops of water escape from the bottle and fall on the claimant, then there is a battery. So battery requires actual contact with the body of another. If you seize my hand, if you spit in my face, if you take me by the collar, then you have basically committed uh, a battery. In the majority of cases, in the majority of cases, um, assault precedes a battery, it comes before a battery, but there are cases where you can have uh, a battery before an assault. So if someone comes and strikes you from behind, you've not seen them, it's an unseen assailant. They strike you fast. It's only after they've exerted their blow on your body that you will feel apprehensive. So technically, in that situation, um, the battery comes before the assault. Uh, let's look at the elements um, or ingredients of the thought of battery. Uh, the first one is the act of the defendant must be direct and intentional. And again, here you look at the case of Collins versus Wilcock, where it was stated that interference with the person's body will generally be lawful where they consented to it. Uh, there is also um, a broad exception to allow for exigencies of everyday life, like jostling in the streets and social contact at parties. I mean, there are parties that can be very congested and for people to make their way through the crowd, they will have to, you know, make contact um, with the person's body. Um, so such um, normal social uh, actions may be excluded. Of course, luckily now we talk about social distancing. So our contact is probably uh, limited. Um, you should also look uh, at Wilson versus Pringle, where uh, it was held that the act of touching the plaintiff has to be intentional and the touching has to be hostile touching. The relevant intention was the intention to do the act. There is no need to establish intention to cause damage. Also note that the issue of hostility in that case is deemed to be a question of fact and would be established on the basis of the facts of each case that you're dealing with. You should also look at the case of um, F versus West Berkshire Health Authority. This case speaks about how broad uh, battery can be construed. Um, in this case, um, it was highlighted that a prank that gets out of hand and over friendly slap on the back surgical treatment by a surgeon who mistakenly thinks that the patient has consented to, to it, all these things may transcend assault. They may transcend the boundaries of lawfulness, sorry. They may also 
transcend the boundaries of lawfulness without being characterized as hostile. So yes, hostility could be there, but um, in some situations, they could be assault without um, exhibiting hostility. The general rule is that consent is necessary to render uh, such treatment um, lawful. So in that case, uh, they emphasize the lack of consent. You get into contact with someone's body when they've not consented to, have to that. <clears throat> I also, <clears throat> I also invite you to look at the case of Wainwright versus Home Office, um, which kind of tends to, to, limit, um, to limit application of assault in, in regard to, to medical cases. Um, and here um, it's stated that in medical cases, the hostility requirement has been um, a bit rejected. In order to avoid an action for a battery, a doctor must show either that consent was given for touching or that the touching was necessary in the best interests of the patient. So the introduction of the whole aspect, the whole aspect of the best interest of the patient, and if a doctor opens you up and uh, for example, you've agreed that they should remove a tumor, but then they now say that's the consent you've given, and now they open up and discover that actually uh, the tumor has eaten up an entire leg and they need to amputate it. Okay? They could act, and we're assuming here you're under anesthesia. The doctor could act and amputate that leg um, without that consent. And uh, if they are accused of assault and they are able to demonstrate that it's, it was in your best interest that the leg was amputated, then um, they may be excused from that assault. I also invite you to read the case of um, Njere Ketia versus Director of Medical Services. Um, it's 1950, volume 17, Iyaka at, at page. Uh, 60. The second element to, to prove, to establish, um, or the second ingredient of battery is there has to be some form of positive act rather than passive act. If a policeman, if you're trying to enter a place and the policeman stands in the doorway and prevents you from entering the room by basically standing in the doorway. Would that amount to an assault? If you juxtapose that with you trying to enter into a place and then the policeman pushes you away, are both those situations assault? Is there a positive act in both those situations? Um, so you can resolve uh, that query by reading Inns versus Wiley, and uh, you juxtapose that with uh, Fagan versus Fagan versus um, Commissioner of Metropolitan Police to be able to distinguish the whole act of a positive act. If I'm just standing there, but preventing you from doing something, is it a positive act or it's a passive act? But that second ingredient, there has to be some action. There has to be some action by the defendant um, towards um, the plaintiff. The third ingredient um, is application we should also um, probably consider a situation where the application 
of force by one party occasions a battery against a third party? Would that stand even if the application of force is not direct? I'll give you an example. If you know you have this quarrelsome and uh, you know violent man, if this violent man is quarreling with his wife, the wife is holding a baby, and in the process of the quarrel, the guy violently pushes the wife, who in turn drops the baby to the, the baby to the floor and the baby is injured. Is it possible that the baby can now sustain an action of battery against the father in this situation, even where the application of force was not direct and intentional in regard to, to the baby? And the answer seems to be yes. Um, I invite you to read the case of Hastings. Um, it's not it's not on the slide. It is H A Y S T E A D versus Director of Public Prosecutions, Volume Three, All England Reports at page um eight fifty. Um, and in that case. It was stated that an act by an assailant could constitute a battery where it directly, through the medium of a third party, caused injury to the, to the victim. Okay, now let's, let's uh, go through uh, the thought of false imprisonment. And false imprisonment is defined as the unlawful restraint of someone which affects the person's freedom of movement. Both the threat of being physically restrained and actually being physically restrained are false imprisonment. The word false here means erroneous or wrong. False imprisonment um, is a strict liability tort and the plaintiff does not need to prove fault on the part of the defendant. In regard to, to, to the elements of false imprisonment, two things are necessary. The total restraint of the liberty of the person is very critical. The detention of the person may be either actual, that is physical, maybe by physically laying hands on that person and, you know, holding them and restraining them, or it could be constructive by mere show of authority. Uh, telling anyone that is wanted and making him accompany him or her to the police station. If a police officer comes and says, you are required at the police station, okay? They are showing that authority and you follow them. So technically, they've, they've, they've restrained you. There is a restraint against you, even if they are not holding you. Um, for example, if a person... Um, t tells you that accompany me to the police station and then uh, puts you in a room at the police station without locking the room but there is someone outside pacing up and down with a gun you are technically uh, constructively restrained although the, the door is, is not locked I'll give you an example. If, if for example, um, let's say Saddam enters a room and, uh, and uh, Babidi present, prevents him from leaving through 
one exit, but does not prevent him from leaving the way Saddam came in. Babirie in this situation has not falsely imprisoned Saddam because Saddam has the option to actually go back through the exit that he came, he came through. That one is not prevented. Okay? You can look at the case of Bad versus Jones. Uh, where it stated that a prison may have its boundary, large or narrow, visible and tangible, enough and tangible. Sorry, a prison may have its boundary, large or narrow, visible and tangible, although real, it may itself be movable or fixed, but a boundary it must have but the boundary it must have. And that boundary, the party imprisoned, and that boundary, the party imprisoned must be prevented from passing. He must be prevented from leaving that place within the ambit of which the party imprisoning would confine him, except by prison break. You can also look at the case of Robinson versus um, Balmain New Ferry Company Limited, where it was held that there was no false imprisonment at all because there was no false imprisonment at all because the claimant was merely called upon to leave the wharf in the way in which. He contracted to leave it. So this is a case where uh, this employee is taken down a mine and then uh, he's supposed to stay down there, of course, working with his colleagues up to a certain time and then probably gets into a bad mood and decides that he wants to leave immediately. And then employers, his employers tell him that, you know, we cannot take you up right now. We'll take you up later at five o'clock when we are leaving work. Um, the mere fact that they couldn't take him up at two o'clock when he demanded uh, should, not, um, should not amount to false imprisonment because he knew that usually they leave and take everyone up at 5 uh, p.m. Also look at the case of Murray versus Ministry of Defense in regard to the issue of... Oh, um, I think I should also briefly go through uh, the defenses. I've already invited you to look at the case of Njere Ketia versus the Director of Medical Services. Um, where there's, if, if consent is given, if consent is given, uh, would it be a battery? Let's say, for example, um, you're going to play a game of football. You know the rules of the game, and you get in there, and someone someone tackles you very badly. Clearly, they've um, they've uh, assaulted you. There is contact. There are all these things, but the fact that you consented to get into this game means that. You cannot found any action in battery, for example, even if you've been battered within the strict sense of the word. Then the other possible defense is, is self-defense. If I act, you know, assault a person or um, I commit a battery against a person in self-defense, or if I even lock them up. Um, in a certain area, if they, they had come to attack me and then I lock them somewhere, uh, then I may not be held liable for any of, of, of those thoughts. 
And uh, there is also the whole aspect of, 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 of contributory negligence. Um, if, if a person is, is assaulted um, or, or battered or falsely imprisoned, but when they in a way contributed to the occurrence of that, um, then uh, the court will assess the degree by which the plaintiff is liable for for the injury and that sum would be used to, to to mitigate the damages to be awarded. So contributory negligence uh, will not be a complete defense here, but it will be considered in the assessment of damages. So thank you very much uh, for listening to me.